fabulous to work with and to be involved in. Uh, he is a person a long time ago when international ophthalmology had a lot fewer people interested, was seriously looking at what could be done and, and how we could affect different areas of the world. And so uh, uh, he's worked very closely with the World Health Organization. He's worked very closely in regards to the uh, International Council of Ophthalmology. Uh, you can't find anything in any of those areas. Besides that, uh, he's a long time chief of one of the preeminent programs in the world at the University of Melbourne and uh, continues to be there. Um, does a lot of traveling. I found out that uh, those of you who made the trip, uh, it, it's not a short trip from here to Melbourne. Um, that's a good long trip and uh, he made it all the way here. He's going to be in the United States four and a half days and head on back. So uh, he hasn't learned any better than uh, Nick Mamelis or Leanne, a lot of us who do a lot of traveling with Jeff Tabin. But it's an, an honor to have him. And before uh, he comes and talks to us, I would like to have uh, uh, Jeff Tabin has a few announcements he'd like to make. Hey, thank you. Well, we have actually three new international fellows. We have uh, Claudia Andrea Lozano Arbea. And she's right here. She's from uh, La Paz, Bolivia. And she'll be with us on the cornea service for a while. And then we have uh, Roshana Singh Rana and also Gita Parajuli. And they've both just arrived. They're both in the Chilganga training program in Nepal. And they'll be with us for a month. Each of them will be two weeks on the neuro-ophthalmology or medical retina service. And then they'll be switching. And then um, I'll turn it over to Professor Taylor. As many of you know, I did uh, my fellowship under Professor Taylor. He's been uh, any small amount that I've uh, learned in anything, whether it's international ophthalmology or life, I, I learned from Professor Taylor. Of course, I forgot more than he, more than he taught me, but uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Randy, and thank you, Jeff, and it really is a pleasure to be here. Let me just uh, wire myself up. Um, as Randy said, it's a bit of a flying visit, and if I still have my Australian accent, it's because I only left my office at 10.30 yesterday morning. <laughs> um, what I wanted to do today, as, this, as you've seen on this slide for the last uh, 15 minutes, is talk a, a little bit about the impact of vision loss, and um, I'm going to talk about that in a range of things. Uh, and I want to talk about what's the dimension of the problem of uh, vision loss, what can we do about it, what are we doing about it, and what should we be doing about it. Uh, and talking in a, in a sort of a broad issue, but um, uh, looking at uh, if, you know, ophthalmology is, business, is, is our profession, then blindness and vision loss is really our business. And we need to be concerned about that impact of uh, vision loss and blindness. And this shows the age-specific rate of blindness and vision loss in Australia, and which is representative of basically all the developed countries. And you can see the amount of blindness or vision loss, and visual impairment here is less than uh, 2040 or driving vision, and blindness is uh, uh, less than 660 which is slightly different from the American definition of blindness, which is 660 or less. But you can see the amount of uh, vision loss increases almost threefold with each decade over the age of 40. So that almost half the people in their 90s have visual impairment and one person in five is legally blind. Now, people think, you know, 80s and 90s are actually sort of too old to really worry about, but the average life expectancy is about 80. And once you've had your 40th birthday, you've got a two out of three chance of having a 90th birthday. So we're not actually talking about very rare people. There are a lot of people who are going to be 80 and 90. And if you look at 10 or 20% of them being blind, it gives a magnitude of the problem we're facing. Now, if we look at the cause of blindness, again, about half the blindness is caused by AMD. About 14% uh, uh, from cataract uh, and uh, unoperated cataract and glaucoma and uh, diabetic retinopathy, but also refractive error 
is an important measurable cause of blindness. People walking around who are functionally blind, who all they need is a pair of glasses. And if you look at visual impairment, it's the same five conditions. AMD, cataract, glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy and refractive error are the five conditions that cause three quarters of the visual impairment. Of course, the proportions and ratios are different and refractive error becomes much more important. And this is the way people function in their day-to-day -day lives. It's not what's their best corrective acuity as we measure it in a lane. This is the way they're actually operating. And so it's very important for us to remember uh, refractive error as a cause of vision loss in addition to AMD, glaucoma, cataract and diabetic retinopathy. And if you look at the prevalence of blindness and, and uh, vision impairment in the US, <coughs> the data are actually a little bit flaky because they have to use the Australian data and data from a variety of studies to put together the best estimate. And this is the work done through the uh, uh, NEI uh, some years ago now, but giving the projected rates of blindness and vision loss in the US. And again, the causes are similar. This is uh, uh, again published in, in archives, uh, but showing those same five conditions, AMD, cataract, glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, and in addition, refractive error. Now, low vision uh, has a very marked <coughs> impact. Even relatively small decreases in acuity uh, have a marked impact. A lot of the definition had been used of less than 2060, but in fact most of the work now is focusing on vision of less than 2040. And it's been shown that acuity of less than 2040, presenting acuity uh, of less than 2040, impacts both on the quality and length of life and prevents healthy and independent ageing. And the break point is really at less than 2040 rather than less than 2060. And it's the, the impact on uh, the tasks of daily life, whether it's your work or leisure, being able to read a newspaper, being safe and being able to get around safely outdoors, particularly in old people, and how people feel about their vision. So that's 2040 is not only important as driving vision, it's actually a very important functional vision. And for people whose vision is less than 2040, they are twice as likely to have a fall four to eight times as likely to have a uh, hip fracture, have three times as much depression, will be admitted to a nursing home or, or supported uh, care three years earlier than people matched for other health and age, just on the basis of having less than 2040, have a, a doubling in their requirement for social support, twice as likely to visit a doctor, and in fact are twice as likely to die. So even small amounts of visual impairment are important and looking at those other figures, two out of three people will lose vision before they die. So it's actually a huge problem in social terms, but it's also a huge problem in economic terms. And looking at the economic impact of low vision, one has to look at, or, or, and, and the vision loss, one has to look at not only the provision of services, the, the curative services, the eye care that we provide, but also the personal or, or out-of-pocket expenses that people with low vision suffer, loss of income, the cost of a carer, that somebody's got a, a daughter or daughter-in-law who's got to take off time from work to drive somebody to, to their doctor's appointment or help them with their shopping, money that's spent on low vision aids and equipment around the house or, or how to make things safe, uh, and also uh, transport because they can't drive themselves, they may not be able to take a bus and so forth. And the amount that people with low vision spend tr varies tremendously depending on their uh, economic status. study we did in Australia is that on average people with low vision are spending about uh, uh, three or four thousand dollars per annum on their various low vision costs and these other out-of-pocket expenses. But obviously that's very related to their ability to, pu uh, to pay and what they can do. We also in Australia looked at how, what's the impact of vision loss uh, on, on uh, uh, the life, that, uh, on disability and the impact in the community and how does it relate to other things. And we found that vision disorders are actually the seventh leading cause of disability. Less important than things like de uh, depression or dementia, but far more important than, than breast cancer, prostate cancer or even HIV AIDS. So as a, 
uh, as a sector, it has a very big impact in terms of uh, disability uh, within the community. And we also looked at the costs of vision loss in Australia. And the total cost, of this, these are uh, figures now some years ago, were $10 billion. And the estimates that were done last year have increased that number to about $16 billion per annum. And Australia's got a population of 22 million, about one-fourteenth the size of the US. Half of that cost or impact of vision loss is due to the impact on well-being, the loss of well-being or the burden of disease. Another third of that is on the indirect costs, the, the loss of income, the cost of, uh, of uh, carers and aids and, and that sort of thing, these indirect costs listed here. And about uh, a quarter of the uh, cost is uh, the direct care given to either. Now, as I mentioned, if you, uh, uh, the average life expectancy now is uh, close to 80, but there's been a big change in life expectancy over the last uh, uh, century or so. And basically, for every year that we've lived, we've got four months for free. And the life expectancy has increased dramatically uh, in Australia, the US, uh, Japan, in fact, globally, uh, although the, the starting point is different. And with that change in life expectancy, there's going to be a, a doubling in the number of people over the age of 60 or over the age of 65 over the next 20 years. And with that doubling, uh, there's going to be a doubling in the number of people with vision loss and blindness just because of the increasing age distribution in the population. And so that the cost of blindness and vision loss is going to become much greater over the next 10 or 20 years than it is today. So what can we do about uh, vision loss? Having shown that it's, not, it's important not only to the individuals, but also uh, it's a, uh, important to the community. And there are actually three simple things we can do. It's deceptively simple. We can prevent the things that we can prevent. We should treat the things that we can treat. And we need to solve the remaining problems. That's doing research on the things we don't know how to treat or prevent at present. And I'd just like to run through so some of the simple things that one can do. In terms of preventing the diseases we can prevent, what we need is appropriately resourced and long-term eye health promotion initiatives to reduce avoidable vision loss. What we need to do is make sure that people who need an eye exam get an eye exam is one thing. And so we, and I'll show you in a moment, uh, had a series of public health uh, uh, promotions about the need for eye exams. Uh, in, uh, there, although many people, about 40% of people will have an eye exam every year, in Australia at least, where we've got universal coverage and have access to services, uh, we still have 15% of people who do not have an eye exam in a five-year period. And so there are people there who need to be seen. The other is um, preventing uh, diseases uh, um, uh, and things like uh, and the link between smoking and AMD and cataract is very important. And so we've also done quite a lot of work in that. And so working with the Australian government, we've got um, compulsory uh, anti-smoking ads on... Uh, uh, lung cancer, heart disease, stroke and stuff on cigarette packets. We also got eye disease included with this, um, uh, you know, very graphic labels uh, on all the packs of cigarettes. But to talk the government into doing this as a government program is actually, uh, you know, quite, uh, quite terrific. It's similar things have been picked up in the UK, uh, but this is, a, this is trying to do something about, particularly AMD, where smokers have three times the risk of AMD, and 30% of AMD is probably attributable to cigarette smoking. And very interestingly, the recent Haynes data that have just been published in the last month is showing a decrease in the amount of AMD, maybe a decrease in the amount of AMD in the US that may be due to changing in smoking rates, which is, which is interesting to think about. The other thing we've been working on is getting these community messages out that people over 40 should have an eye exam at least once every five years unless they're in a high risk group. And the high-risk groups are obviously people who've noticed a change in vision should be looked at right away. People who have diabetes 
need their annual eye exam. In Australia, it's actually every two years because in general, the level of uh, care and control of diabetes across the community is better than the US, and so a two yearly exam is what's recommended there. People with a family history of glaucoma need to be uh, assessed. Those over the age of 70 probably need to be looked at it, uh, every year or two. Uh, and obviously, if you're under the care of a uh, practitioner, um, you need to follow their advice. So if Jeff Tobin says you've got to come back tomorrow for your corneal ulcer, you need to do that, don't wait five years. Um, but interestingly, this, uh, this is a, another ad or campaign that we had the uh, uh, talk the government into running, uh, increasing the awareness of the need for eye exams. And uh, this is what a healthy eye looks like and this is what an unhealthy eye looks like. You can't spot the difference, meaning you know, that you do need to have these regular eye exams. And what you don't need is if you've had a normal eye exam and they're otherwise normal, you don't need to be examined every year. You do not need to be examined every two years. Those are a whole lot of unnecessary exams that are filling up our chairs and offices with the worried well, and we're not getting to the people who need to be looked at who are not being examined. And refractive error, I mean, even though it's, it's you know, something we don't spend a lot of time thinking about, is actually very important in the community. And this shows just in Australia the number of people who have uh, a vision of a presenting vision of less than 2040 who just need a pair of glasses to bring them back to uh, at 20 or uh, to better than 2040. And see, there's you know, a large number, particularly as you get into the older age groups. Right, we talked briefly about diabetes, but people with diabetes have 25 times the risk of vision loss. 98% of that uh, the severe vision loss is, uh, can be prevented uh, by timely laser treatment. People need their regular eye exams every one year in the US, every two years in Australia, to be able to find those who need treatment. But only half of the people with diabetes are getting those regular exams, and a third of the people with diabetes have never had an eye exam. And these figures are for Australia, but they're exactly the same in the US. So we are clearly failing to reach all those people with diabetes who need to be looked at. And so there's a message there for us to talk to the internists, to the family practitioners, to the uh, diabetologists, to make sure we have those links so that all the patients they're treating with diabetes are getting the examinations they need. We need to treat the diseases we can treat. Obviously, there's, uh, uh, we need adequate funding and resourcing be able to provide services to the whole community that needs them. Cataract surgery, on the one hand, is, is a classic case where uh, one, we need to do that, and also providing low vision services uh, for those who we cannot reverse the, 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 the low vision. And in general, only a third of the people who are blind are actually using low vision services, and only about 10% of people who have low vision, less than 2060 are using low vision services. And their quality of life and ability can be improved dramatically with uh, you know, even simple low vision aids. But with cataract, everybody will develop cataract if they live long enough. And basically 100% of people in their 90s will have lens opacities, although half of them have already been operated on. Cigarette smoking and UV exposure are the only two modifiable risk factors, I mean other than sort of uh, ionising radiation or high dose steroids. But uh, but cigarette smoking, UV, are the only thing that we can address. And cataract is by far the most common of all the elective surgical procedures and by far the largest cost in eye care. Um, but cataract surgery is also extraordinarily cost effective and costs uh, uh, 20, 20, dollars $20 per quality adjusted life year. Um, treating hypertension is about $20,000 per quality. Uh, treating diabetes is about $40,000 per quality. You know, a heart uh, transplant is about close to half a million dollars per quality. Cataract surgery is so cost effective, we cannot afford to have people sitting around in our community with unoperated cataract. The community just cannot afford that loss. So we need to make sure that cataract surgery is available for everybody in the community, not just those with private health insurance. And then we need to do uh, more research to uh, solve the present problems, uh, particularly looking at uh, AMD and glaucoma. And AMD uh, increases dramatically in the older age group, so that uh, two out of three people will have at least early AMD in their 90s, 
and uh, a quarter of people will have vision loss from it. Um, there's not a lot you can do to uh, change your family history and there's been a huge amount of work done on the, uh, the genes associated particularly with uh, uh, neovascular AMD. Uh, cigarette smoking is the only modifiable risk factor that we've got and there have been a whole lot of other risk factors listed there that really are uh, uh, not uh, consistently shown. But if we could just slow the progression of AMD by only 10%, just a small change in the rate of progression of vision loss from AMD, it would have huge savings. And again, you could multiply that figure by 14-fold uh, to bring it up to a US number so that there is a huge impact and cost from even a slow reduction, let alone uh, being able to prevent or reverse uh, AMD. But glaucoma is, uh, a, um, a, has a different sort of um, appearance through the community. About one person in 11, or you know, about 10% of people, will ultimately develop glaucoma if they live long enough. Glaucoma doesn't keep rising the way cataract and AMD tend to. Glaucoma seems to plateau off, so there are people clearly at risk. And a family history is the most important factor uh, by far, increasing the risk of glaucoma three to four fold. Any of the other risk factors might increase it by uh, 20 or 30 percent, but a family history increases it by three or four hundred percent. Orders of magnitude different. The most important thing about glaucoma is sort of early diagnosis so you can have appropriate treatment and control uh, of IOP and stuff. But half the people with glaucoma are undiagnosed and are therefore untreated. And half of those people who are undiagnosed have had an eye exam in the last 12 months and have been missed. So somebody's checked their pressure or taken a flash to some sort of light over their disc and just not actually looked at them properly. And so we're actually having walking through our, ch going, you know, sitting on our chairs in our, in our uh, uh, examination lanes, all these people with undiagnosed glaucoma. And the reason they're, un they're not being diagnosed is people are not doing visual fields on them. And the, one of the, the biggest reasons that people are not doing visual fields and not thinking about glaucoma is they don't know that they have a family history that puts them at high risk of developing glaucoma. So the single most important thing that we can do is to make sure that our patients who have glaucoma tell their relatives, their first degree relatives, that there is a family risk of glaucoma. So we see all the patients who are known with glaucoma, that's our easy link into everybody who's got a first degree relative with glaucoma. So what we need to do is we need to, each patient you see with glaucoma, you need to ask them or tell them, instruct them, inform them, encourage them to tell their first degree relatives, their brothers and sisters, their sons and daughters, hey, I've got glaucoma and you will be at risk of having glaucoma too. So when their family member comes for an eye exam, they can say, hey, my mother, brother, whatever, has glaucoma, please check me out to make sure I don't have it. And that will be enough of a cue for us to actually look further than just as a routine exam. So that's a very important thing that we can do to pick up those half the people with glaucoma who are undiagnosed. And we looked at um, uh, some of the economic, health economic impact of glaucoma and, and um, what you can do and where, you know, where things are with drugs. And I know there's I've been a whole lot of correspondence recently about uh, all the prostaglandin inhibitors uh, going generic and what that's going to do for, for costing. But a change in treatment to have initial laser uh, trabeculoplasty would be tremendously cost savings in terms of uh, 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 preventing vision loss from glaucoma. You get 24 hour a day, seven day a week compliance after your ALT. You don't have to worry about the person removing to put in drops. You don't have to worry about whether they can afford to re refill the prescription. And if it lasts one year or 10 years, they've gone that long with good control without the need of drops. And so there's, a, and you know, occasionally having to take uh, pills and medication myself, I know if I get to have it fixed up by having one bit of surgery and it lasted for a year or 10 years, there is absolutely no question in my mind, my very first stop would be an ALT or an SLT. 
But that's not what we're doing. Most people don't do that. Most people put them on Zalatan or something, and the, and we know that a third of I mean, uh, uh, probably only a third of the people are fully compliant. A third of them will don't even uh, you know are not using the prescriptions uh, at the end of a year. So our compliance with glaucoma medication is just atrocious. So that the really the the thinking more about that SLT or ALT as your first line in glaucoma will make a huge difference into that uh, um, uh, overall management. We looked at if we did those three simple things that we were talking about, if we prevented the diseases that we could prevent, if we had adequate resources to treat the diseases we can treat, particularly cataracts, uh, uh, and if we uh, provided some additional funds for research, now what would that cost and what that would save? And in Australia, when we modelled this out, it cost about uh, just under $200 million additional funds per annum. Not a big amount, but in the first year, it would return almost a billion dollars. So there's a five-fold return on investment. And a lot of this is just getting people their glasses, getting uh, people getting you know, examined, picking up some of the diabetics and stuff. And the same thing over the lifetime of the people uh, was, uh, again, uh, over five-fold return. So for each dollar invested in eye care, there is a five dollar return to the community. So that's a very good investment for a community to make. And if you look at the uh, costs of uh, vision loss in the US, and this is um, uh, you know, Prevent Blindness America uh, data, and their estimate there was uh, 51 billion. Um, I think that's wrong by about a factor of threefold and uh, because there's a lot of stuff that's been left out and there's an article that we had in uh, uh, investigative ophthalmology about a year back uh, with a uh, consensus panel about the factors that you need to put in and I think people uh, would agree that that figure should probably be in, uh, about threefold larger than that. Uh, we've also done work on the cost of uh, vision loss in Canada and uh, the UK and uh, Japan looking at, and the figures are remarkably similar. There may be differences in the distribution of, of uh, disease, there may be differences in the healthcare system, but relative to uh, healthcare provision, that impact of uh, vision loss is remarkably consistent. Now what's happening globally? Um, where is vision sort of uh, uh, worldwide? And uh, in uh, 1995, uh, the estimate was that there were 45 million people blind. And the disease is a little bit different here. We, cataract causes half the blindness globally. Uh, glaucoma still is about 14%. And glaucoma is very interesting. If you look at, at uh, data going back to the 1880s and through the early 1900s through today, glaucoma stays at around 10 to 12% year after year after year in one country after another, and it doesn't matter if you're looking at Germany or the UK or the US or Australia or the developing countries, glaucoma has remained. While the other causes of blindness have gone from being infectious disease, ophthalmia neonatorum, syphilis, smallpox, through cataract and, and uh, diabetes in uh, the developed countries, and now we're looking at AMD, <coughs> but globally, um, uh, cataract causes half the, the blindness and glaucoma is still important. But anyway, uh, trachoma uh, and corneal opacities are still important, but the big thing that happened between 95 and 2004 was there was, for the first time ever, globally, there was a decrease in the number of people with blindness. And that's been a lot of work done with Vision 2020 programs like the Himalaya Cataract Program, the International Ophthalmology work that Jeff's doing and others. Uh, getting these services out to these areas. And just uh, in the last uh, month, WHO has uh, released uh, new data to show that, uh, in, that now include those with refractive error, but again showing a further decrease uh, to just under uh, 40 million when you add in those people with, uh, which are about five or, or six percent who've got uh, uh, uncorrected refractive error. And this is despite a very significant increase in the population, in the global population, and a particular increase in the older people in the global population. So that progress is being made globally on reducing the amount of, of um, uh, blindness and vision loss. And these are some data that came out uh, uh, last year that show that the 
total impact of blindness globally is about $4,000 billion per annum. I mean, it's a huge uh, cost on the, on the world. And it's interesting that about one or one and a half trillion dollars of impact is due to refractive error. And then the two and a half trillion dollars is uh, uh, the, the other uh, causes of, of vision loss. And you don't have to worry necessarily about all these uh, different categories about um, the direct costs and deadweight costs and stuff. There's some of the health economic uh, mumbo jumbo that goes to give you uh, these sort of global figures. Um, which shows the huge impact of vision loss. And uh, globally, not only does uh, blindness lead, as I've talked about, to that individual um, impact, but it, 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 it's a major contribu contributor to poverty, both for the individual who loses their economic livelihood, to the family who's got to look after somebody who's not generating income or helping grow food, and in some of these countries, a blind person can be referred to as a mouth without hands. It's somebody who, and actually you have to have a child often look after the blind relative. So you're actually losing two people from the economic system of these subsistence farmers. And of course it contributes to, to uh, community poverty. Uh, globally, 80% of this blindness and vision loss is preventable. And some of the interventions are extraordinarily inexpensive. We talked about cataract surgery at 2020, uh, or two, you know, two thousand dollars per quality. Distributing vitamin A capsules is about the most cost-effective thing you can do in the world. It's even more cost-effective than immunisation uh, at uh, two dollars uh, a quality adjusted life year. And screening for diabetic retinopathy, much more complicated, much more difficult, is still uh, only uh, fifteen thousand dollars per quality. And there's some, some work done uh, recently by uh, um, uh, Pollock and, and uh, Cooper from uh, London uh, looking at the impact of cataract surgery in these developing countries and uh, uh, looking at the change in uh, economic benefit in the community uh, and, and in the uh, households uh, of people who've had cataract surgery, um, showing that uh, those people who've been operated on have uh, uh, vastly improved compared to how they were before surgery. And this is uh, uh, a measurement of quality of life, sh again showing huge changes, not only, not only in the economic area, but also in the rating of ability. All right, so what can we do about, uh, about vision loss? I mean, one, a little bit like climate change, one needs to think globally, but you need to also act uh, locally. Um, and locally, each of you here can work somewhere along a spectrum. At least you need to be aware of the problem of vision loss in your own community, in your own country, in your own hemisphere, in our own world. Be aware of it. The next step of engagement would be supportive or become an advocate. Uh, see what you can do uh, to help. It may be you change your research, you start to focus on some of these issues or diseases to see how your research could contribute to doing something about uh, vision loss. You may go and work with Jeff Tabin and uh, you know, <laughs> we spend three months a year overseas. Uh, Randy, I didn't say that. <laughs> I don't want all your faculty to go overseas, but you, you may do that. Or some people may say, well, I'll become an Albert Schweitzer and go and live in Africa and, and commit my full time there. There's a range of things you can do, but even if you're just aware and an advocate and are supporting other people who are doing this work, you're making a big difference. But in our own practice, in our own the patients you see this morning, you need to think about the things we've talked about. You need to think about glaucoma. You know, what are you doing? Are you alerting all your patients with glaucoma about family history? Are you actually checking relatives who have glaucoma well enough? What are we doing to reach the, the diabetics? Are we making sure that everyone with diabetes is actually getting their eyes examined? What are we doing about the underserved people in our community? Are we actually providing care out there? Or are we just sitting there looking at the people who come into our clinic? You know, are we actually doing what we can in our own community to practice these things about trying to reduce or minimise vision loss? And a lot of that is also advocacy. You know, talking to, uh, to people about the importance of vision 
and the importance of things that we can do about as I've been uh, going through today. And vision loss is difficult and I get a lot of inspiration from Helen Keller who is uh, photographed here. Um, and a quote that she said, because I can't do everything, I will not refuse to do the something I can do. And we can do something about vision loss and blindness. It's very achievable to eliminate blindness and vision loss. If we wanted to, we could operate on everybody with vision loss from cataract by Christmas. There's no way we could get rid of obesity by Christmas or alcoholism by Christmas or cardiac disease by Christmas. But to eliminate cataract blindness or to give everybody a pair of glasses is very finite. We can actually do that. The other thing I like about this uh, photograph, and it's actually, you can see there's some writing here, Helen Keller wrote in pencil, and it's, and it's pressed into the photograph. Um, and then Polly Thompson, who at this stage uh, is this woman, uh, who was uh, her eyes and ears and companion, uh, and it's written uh, in thank you to my grandfather, who was also an ophthalmologist there. Uh, so I'd like to end there, and I'd be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Randy. So he was very good and uh, obviously a great chance for us to get a, a good international look at the problem where it is. I'd like you to comment a little further on the end study because, uh, I mean, they're crowing about it a lot and talking and, and they're giving figures as though that between 2004 and now that uh, there's potentially decreases as much as almost a third. And uh, uh, I'm a little fearful that people will think, oh my gosh, you know, we've got this many licks. And, and at the most, we've got a couple of low hanging fruit that right now seem to be stabilizing fairly well if indeed it is uh, taking antioxidants and smoking yeah. and sedatives. But I worry we've got a, really a phantom nerve problem and this may not be as real as they think. I mean, you, you're, you're the one who's done a lot of this epidemiology. I mean, you're one of the grandfathers. And I'd love your input about that because it's, it's a big deal right now. And the implication is, yeah. oh my gosh, we're, you know, we're, we're licking this problem. I don't believe the data. They had uh, over 900 people that they excluded out of a sample of uh, uh, 7,000, about 7,000. So it's almost 20% of people they threw away. And they threw away people they couldn't get a photograph on. Mm -hmm. They threw away people who were blind. Mm -hmm. um, so if, you, if you're throwing, a w I mean, it's those people were not randomly distributed. <coughs> the people who were excluded from the analysis are going to be your high risk, highest risk people. And so those numbers are really flaky. I, you know, I just, I couldn't imagine in that brief period of time, and if you, if you look at, at what all the smoking stage, I mean, it's, it's been going down, but it's actually kind of plateaued. We're, we're yeah. in, in the latest figure that CMH has gone up a little bit. I just, I, it's hard yeah. to believe to me that there are... Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I think that uh, with that uh, uh, high percentage of, of uh, exclusion or, or, you know, failure of ascertainment, uh, those data are, are very suspect. And what you really have there is a sensitivity analysis and say if everybody we didn't look at had AMD, what would be the number? Because what they've assumed is nobody they didn't look at had AMD. Or, so, so you, you could go from, the, they've presented the very best case example, you need to present the... Well, if the rate in these other people was the same as those we examined, what would it be? And then you get a third, uh, third estimate. So that, uh, and that's the sort of sensitivity analysis that I think the uh, uh, reviewers or the editors should have insisted that paper had. So, so your sense is absolutely right, and and I don't believe the average believe the analysis uh, was a secondary analysis, and if you look at the breakdown of the average data. Um, uh, those with neovascular did a little bit better than the average, which means those with geographic atrophy did a lot worse. Uh, and those never properly teased out. And we know that zinc on its own doesn't do anything. We know that vitamin E on its own doesn't do anything. We know that vitamin C on its own doesn't do anything. We know that we, you can't use vitamin A in the high risk people because they're all smokers. And that increases their risk of cancer. So I think that that ARIDS um, bubble uh, was uh, not well evidence-based. That's a pretty controversial you have, you position. Have any hope for Arabs too that maybe it'll be a little better. 
Um, it'll be really interesting to see what it comes up with. And, you know, uh, the Israeli said there's lies, don't lies and statistics. <laughs> and you can pull these analyses in different ways. And, you know, the I had $100 million in Arabs. The drug companies wanted to sell it. People want to have good news stories. You know, you've got to sell something to the Congress to get your funding. And so there's lots of pressure to, and, and of course the ophthalmologists want to do it, do something. They want to have patients come and say, look, you're going to go blind from AMD, there's nothing I can do about it. They say, look, you know, you've got early AMD, but if you take this, you might not go lose vision. So, I mean, everybody wants it to work. Um, but I, I, I don't find those data convincing. ARIDS 2 will be very interesting to see what they, uh, what they come up with. Well, we're involved in it. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, and, and um, I, I really, I, I just applaud your work. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, where can Neil and who do the study looking at the barriers and why patients did not get diabetic eye exams or had diabetic yep. or the early eye examination? And I mean, they're at Purity Hospital, only 40% of patients in the early examination. And there were a number of different barriers. So what is interesting? Yep. And, and they thought they understood uh, you know, a lot of what the physicians were saying. But what, what I'm getting at is that I find sometimes as a physician that I'm concerned that I'm not really getting the information that the patient needs to get or to them. If I think I am, but what they are actually understanding from it, I, you know, I'm not sure. I look at your pictures and I think, wow, this is great. Do you work with someone to help that? I mean, do you? Um, you'll see that uh, my current position is I, I'm uh, working on uh, Aboriginal eye health or Indigenous eye health, where we're not only working across a, a doctor-patient barrier or divide, but we're also working across a cultural divide as well. And so it's extraordinarily important to understand what are the, if you like, the patient uh, perceptions there. Um, and. Uh, you know, it, 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 you've got to sit down and talk to people and it's sort of a, in a structured way. You know, you're not going to do research by sort of you know, putting a drop or something on a, on a 96-well plate or strangling a cat or something. Um, you, you're going to do a properly designed study. You're not going to get information about the community perceptions without doing properly designed studies. And, you know, whether they're focus groups, whether they're different ways of consulting. But it's to understand the patient barriers to, to utilisation and care is very important uh, if you're planning those larger services. Absolutely agree with you. Yes, sir. You mentioned a hassle with a couple of patients who had a, an exam or missed a yep. exam. That's concerning. Is, is that mostly a normal function of a couple of patients, you think, or is it based on practitioner? No, no the, 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 um, there, there are a couple of things that were interesting. Um, uh, Everybody except for, I think, one patient had measurable detectable field defect. The range of pressures were, were um, in the same range as those with diagnosed glaucoma. The range of disc cupping were in the same range as those with uh, diagnosed glaucoma. So it wasn't as though they were all very early um, glaucoma. There was actually some very advanced glaucoma that was missed. But the thing that they all had, or almost all had, was a field loss. So if somebody checked their field, they would have been picked up. But you're not going to do a field on everybody as part of a routine exam, which is why that alert of say, hey, you know, um, somebody in my family's got glaucoma, can you make sure I don't have it, is so important. And the only way we'll get that is by us telling our patients with glaucoma, you've got to tell your first degree relatives. Does that help? So, so to you raise a very good uh, uh, point. Obviously, intraocular pressure we know is, uh, has a relationship, but it's not particularly yeah. a, a, a real strong relationship. And uh, I've been impressed the number of people, both in the visual field or OCT, where the nerve looks pretty darn good, and it turns out they've probably got problems. So, yeah. well, what, what do you think? I mean, should, should we go into secondary? I mean, obviously, that's going to add a lot of expense. 
I'm, I mean, now I'm a corneal surgeon, <laughs> so I'm on shaky ground when I'm talking about AMD and antioxidants or glaucoma or low vision. But um, I, uh, but you, I think. Yeah. The point you make is, is you've you got to look at the impact over yeah. a large population. Glaucoma is important as a disease in its impact on visual function. That's what's important. You know, the number of nerve fibres you've got or don't have don't matter. What matters is what you can see or what you can't see. So, so to my mind, the sine qua non for glaucoma is field loss. Now, of course... If you pick it up early, you can treat it before it gets worse. And, and you know, I'm not saying that you should forget about the disc and nerve fibres altogether. But to my mind, the key, the thing, I mean, uh, if I lost, you know, 40% uh, of my nerve fibres and still had complete feel, who cares? I, and if that's the, you know, the day before I die, who cares? So the, feel, the loss of nerve fibres themselves in the absence of demonstrable field loss is, is of itself not important. Um, the, uh, so so I, I put a lot of value in, into field, but I'm not suggesting, and, and I, uh, I also think that the FDT is terrific. And, and when we did, you know, uh, examination of a whole lot of Aboriginal people who know you've got all the cultural barriers and language barriers and stuff, I mean, they can all do FDT in a snap. You just tell them to push the button when they see the lightning flashing. You know, it's nothing about grids or patterns, it's just, that, you know, the lightning flashes and, you know, they bing, they, away they go. Um, so one could do that very quickly and easily if you wanted to as a routine test. And, and I would suggest it's actually a lot easier to do than OCT on everybody. But, but I think the, the easier thing for us to do, when there's something we can do immediately today with almost no change in our practice, every patient we see with glaucoma, you should put that message is, please tell your relatives, first degree relatives, that they're at risk too and to get checked out. Now that's very simple. Thank you. Yeah, hang on. We're, we're one more. Sorry. Thank you very much for the lecture. It was always very interesting and, and a key figure in your own display. We should be able to discuss that. So, so I'll give thanks for guiding this in the, in the round. Um, you know, it is incredibly frustrating um, dealing with patients who are diagnosed, even you know, in the community here, because there are so many patients that come in who don't have access to care and then have advanced degrees of presentation, and we know that you know the chances of good Um, I, I think that um, to have a non midriatic retinal photograph um, and a visual acuity test, because you, you're not going to pick up all the early uh, macular edema uh, necessarily on a, a retinal photograph, a, no, a non midriatic retinal, a single retinal photograph. Uh, so that, uh, and, and you're not necessarily going to pick up their cataract either on the retinal photo photograph. So you need a, a visual acuity and uh, a retinal photograph. And I think that the best way to do that is actually put the retinal cameras in the local pathology labs where people go to have their blood taken and they go to have their uh, ECG or their urine done or what have you. Put cameras there so the family docs can sign EC, uh, EKG, uh, you know, electrolytes, hemoglobin A1C, uh, whatever, and retinal pho photography. That's where I see is it, that's a one-stop shop. I mean, people with diabetes have to go to the uh, the pharmacy every month to get their prescriptions. They've got to go to the family practitioner every two or three months to get their blood pressure or the blood sugar or something else sorted out. You know, they don't want to spend half a day sitting outside somebody's office in an eye centre and then come away not being able to work for another five hours because they're dilated. I mean, there's not enough hours in their year to do that. So you'd need to make it easy, and I think that non-mirriatic photography plus an acuity check somewhere where they go. 
and you're not going to be able to put those cameras in every family practitioner's office. You can put them in every diabetic clinic, so that'll be another place to do it. But the place all the diabetics go to, sort of at least, well, at least once a year, sometimes a lot more often, is that local path lab. And so to my mind, that'll be a very smart place to put it. Well, yeah, I've got one more. Sorry, Randy. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I've just been reading some interesting papers written by Pelly, you know, who, who do the Pelly Robson charts and stuff, um, looking at, and also from the people in the folk in Alabama, where they're doing, in Birmingham, where they're doing a lot of work on sort of driving and stuff. And um, the, the field defects uh, uh, have a variable impact on driving and are, are very um, uh, individual specific, which is interesting. Um, the other thing is, if you just do field checks without anything else, you're going to pick up all those people who've had strokes and, or got cataract or something else. And so you need to, if you're just doing a field screening, this is something else we sort of tested out in a, in a population, people aged in their 70s, um, that you need to do a couple of questions before you do the field test and, and a measure of visual acuity. Because if there are visual acuities down, they need an automatic referral. But but it's built, you know, the idea of building some sort of automatic system makes, uh, has got a lot to explore. It's, it's a good idea. The, the idea in the United States, I mean, everybody has to drive almost if, <coughs> if you can. And that's one time you can catch everybody every five years. And, yeah. And it, it, as a screen, if there's a problem, as they do now, I mean, if they yeah. have a visual acuity problem, you said you, you got to go have this check. Yeah. And, and, and to throw a, th and put an FTT, you know, push the button when you see the lightning. Um, would work well too. Yeah. Well, he was right. very good as always. Okay. We really appreciate it.